Hello and welcome to the 24th episode of the Mike McNair Revolutionary Strategy Series. Today is Monday the 9th of September 2019 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week we start the penultimate chapter, Chapter 8, Political Consciousness, and are greeted by the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. If you'd like to help out the show, you can join the Patreon gang gang for as little as $5 a month, which works out at about $1 an episode. Patrons get special bonus episodes, the right to vote on the Reading Group series, and other cool stuff too. When we reach 100 patrons, we'll be producing a second patron-only podcast every month. The next one is due to drop next week, and is a two-parter with the good man Mike McNair himself. If you'd like to comment on the show, please do so on the YouTube channel, and make sure to like, subscribe and share. You can also join me on Facebook or Twitter too. Right, to the discussion. We have an exceptionally full panel here today. It's so full, we're going to have to have our own special mechanisms for figuring out who's going to talk next. Let's start from the right, and let's start. The most right wing of us all is trans trans revolution. Sophie, how are you doing? I resent that. I am not the most right wing. <laughs> I can guarantee you that. And you're a bad person, Dom. Uh, all I'm saying is that that's how YouTube puts the people down here in front of me you're on the right youtube don't lie they know everything about you they got you know your what? email address and all that shit going on we are starting this stream off on a bad foot tom that's all i'm saying fair enough that wouldn't be alphabetical uh, poo- order would it? it that would be alphabetical order right next we got puya all the way from uh all the way from let me see if i get this right detroit yes yes or pretty close to detroit like yeah it's called ypsilanti good to see you tom uh, yeah. Now, it's not snowing in uh, where Lexi is, unlike Detroit. Lexi, wh- where are you? I'm basically as close to New York City as Puya is to Detroit, with a similarly uh, insignificant town name that I won't trouble you with. And uh, let's see, there's some kind of crazy-ass surreal sun shower going on. So I feel like the four horses of the apocalypse are riding in. Feels good. Feels good, man. Does anybody know that song? Is it the Four Horsemen in the Apocalypse? Is it by, uh, I mean, you know, the guy Vangelis? Is he like some like Greek guy? It was like a 70s oh, yeah. band. Do you know that yeah, one? He did, the he first did all the horse soundtracks was in the a 80s. green. Yeah. Second one was a red. The third one was a black. It's a fucking brilliant song. <laughs> it's so shit. Uh, moving oh, yeah, I don't know it. <laughs> I'll get it up here. Although YouTube will probably strike my account. Let's see if we can get it going when we're talking. <laughs> YouTube, Kyle, YouTube over will to fuck Kyle. You up. They will fuck me off. Kyle, where are you from, coming from? Uh, I am coming from Calgary, Alberta, Canada, right in the middle of Stampede. And, what is Stampede? Uh, you know, our, uh, Stampede is like a gigantic fair slash agricultural exhibition slash everybody gets really drunk of it and yeah it's it's happening it's my first time here for a stampede so it's going to be interesting is this like the equivalent to the in ireland they have the plowing championships for yeah totally people? it's like that but gigantic sounds great so and lastly here we have the derek varn c derek varn welcome back to the show derek how's it going Hi, we're on our 16th episode, which is probably the same number as there are fourth internationals. <laughs> <laughs> or as you can see here, not as many as there are Aphrodite's child. Here we go. Are we ready? Are you oh ready for God. this? <laughs> Ah, come on here, let's get going. Where is this? Oh, it takes a while to get going. All right, let's hear. Let's see, here we go. There you go. That's enough of that. Fuck yeah. 
I'm sort of stunned. Uh, you know what I said about you being an Irish scene kid earlier? I think I'm doubling down on that. <laughs> what scene are you talking about? This is like 1973. How old do you think I am? God damn it. Enough of this shit talk. We're going to start here and we're going to jump into chapter eight. We've got two chapters left. So with this chapter here is called Political Consciousness and International Unity. Now, what's this stuff all about? Well, he gets into a lot of stuff here on why we need a proper international. And also he gets into a whole spiel on a whole load of terribly bad communist political strategy. So with further ado, let, let's hop in and I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs here. The question of internationalism as an element of the working class strategy was also critical in understanding the split in the second international. Fighting for unity of the workers as an international class unavoidably involved splitting with the coalitionist right, which placed and places loyalty to the nation state before loyalty to the working class. The common term characterized the second international's collapse in the face of 1914 as resulting in part from its failure to organize real international unity and proposed as an alternative, a much more tightly centralized and disciplined international. Yet the common turn was dissolved in 1943, leaving behind the looser common form of communist parties, which like the socialist parties were fundamentally nationalist in their strategic horizons. So wh what is this common form? Who knows what this common form was? It's what's left over after the the third international dissolves, and the common the common form is like basically the the formal channels of the official communist parties and the Soviet bloc, and I think some other like European communist parties that were Soviet adjacent. It sort of dissolved. It sort of comes out of the fact that Stalin had trouble maintaining the common turn with all I don't know his calling people to to Russia to meet them and then killing them thing that he was doing. So, you know, that's part of this that McNair isn't talking about. <laughs> that would do it. That would do it. Okay, let's, let's keep going here with this bit. The Trotskyists founded their fourth international in 1938 as a world party of socialist revolution, something in theory even more centralized than the Comintern. In 1953, this world party broke up into two competing organizations, the International Secretariat of the Fourth International, ISFI, a predecessor of today's Mandalite Fourth International, and the International Committee of the Fourth International, the ICFI. That's all very clear stuff. The European core of the ISFI has remained relatively stable as an international organization. The same cannot be said for its politics. The current Mandalite FI has become unequivocally an organization like the Second International. That is, it is a loose coordination of nationalities, in this case, mostly grouplets, whose leaders meet periodically and pass diplomatic resolutions. The ICFI tradition has given rise to a bewildering array of internationals, Heliite and sub-Heliite variants, Lambertiste and sub-Lambertiste, Lorista and sub-Lorista, Morinista and sub-Morinista, Spartacist and sub-Spartacist, and so on. Almost all of these internationals are the international fan clubs of national organisations in the main historic centres of Trotskyism, France, the US, Britain, and weirdly, Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> My God. Yeah. Uh, reading that has taken it out of me. Yeah, what, what's funny is I don't think about France as a center of Trotskyism because the dissident communist core after 1968 in France ends up being like weirdo, quasi anti Stalinist Maoism, which is really, really weird. As a person who technically comes out of a sub Spartacist split, it's funny because I was I was thinking about the names here and these have degenerated to the point that like we don't even know like even someone who like me who's kind of a trot historian like I, I just like the history of Trotskyism because it's so fractious I don't even know some of these factions <laughs> like, I'm like who are they the parent of you know what's also kind of hilarious is none of these groups even in their in their main headquarters the US Britain and I guess Argentina, none of them are like larger than a few thousand people at all. Most of them are probably more like five or 600, as we discovered when the ISO 
dissolved. So yeah, I mean the the ICFI has split probably about thirty two times. There's like a flow chart I've seen on the internet for that. Yeah, I just wanted to say about like the Argentinian case. There was a recent episode of Radio War Nerd on like Peron and like 20th century Argentinian politics. And they kind of get into like why Trotskyists became somewhat prevalent in Argentina in there. So if people want to check that out, it's worth a listen. Why? What's the short story? I honestly could not tell you. <laughs> like I don't I don't I don't want to be like the 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 one who comes here and tells you all about Argentinian politics when I've just listened to a podcast on it, but it's worth a couple hours of a listen. There's a lot of weird sort of idiosyncratic things about Argentinian politics that kind of led to that. Isn't it true that like Trotskyism is is kind of prevalent in South America in general? I don't know a lot about it, but I always was under the impression that like it was partially because, well, okay, so Trotskyism is kind of prevalent in South America and in Latin America generally, and I think part of it was because Trotsky lived in in Mexico for a while. Mexico is North America, goddamn Americans. That's North America. Uh, that's why I changed it to say in Latin America more generally. So shush up, Tom. <laughs> There's this weird debate whether or not it's Central America or North America because of the distinction with Anglo-North America. But to get to focus in on the Latin American question, a couple of things. Having lived in Mexico, the predominant Marxist groups are either left communist or Stalinist and are, are their anarchists at this point. There was a big tradition of Trotskyism. It seems to have largely faded. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there's still some Mexican trot organizations in Venezuela, the Trotskyists have some kind of relationship to Chavismo and were supposedly inspirations for Chavez, although their relationship seems to have faded during Maduro's time. I know a little bit about the Argentinian case, too. I was also talking to someone from uh, Peru about Peruvian trots, and he was enlightening me that like there's more than Posadist out there which is the other reason we associate Latin America with Trotskyism is Posadism is, was a real tendency in Latin America. That said, what do you, what do you make of how fractious these attempts to internationals become? That, because when they attempt to centralize under a transitional program, they almost immediately split. And the other thing they split over, it takes to mentioning the, uh, the British case for me to actually start recognizing some of these names more. The other thing they split over is their understanding of what the Soviet Union was. And it seems so strange that that was the dominating split causing mechanism. And frankly, as McNair points out in the first chapter, all their predictions about what that meant were wrong. What do you mean by that, Derek? Well, McNair points out that w depending on if what how you define this ASSR as a bureaucratic collectivism, de uh, degenerated worker state, uh, state capitalism, what kind of state capitalism, they all also had a prediction, every single one of those groups, about how the USSR is going to end before 1992. And I was arguing with somebody about this, uh, Douglas Lane, and we came to a compromise position on this. But I pointed out that all the state capitalist people and all the deformed worker state people had theories of what they thought the USSR was going to turn into, none of them was collapse in the capitalism and none of them predict how it happened at all. And so when people talk about these distinctions now, they tend to omit the predictive elements of them. But that was part of why it was a split worthy thing is because they all thought you had to do something specific to redeem the Soviet Union. Well, I think, didn't Trotsky kind of predict that the USSR was either going to go to capitalism or the workers would have to remove a bureaucracy? Yeah, so th that's sort of what I was going to say in response to why there is this problematic deal with predictions and Trotskyism, is that Trotsky's analysis to a degree holds up before the Second World War, because he thinks that the Soviet Union has to either collapse into capitalism or have a full political revolution to socialism. What he doesn't see happening is the USSR sticking around for a few decades as some kind of weird in-between state. That sends Trotskyism as a whole as like a research program into a death spiral because they don't understand how this thing could hang around. And we skipped over the paragraph about uh, Lutte Ouvrière, the French wing, but 
this is it's kind of my favorite, actually, the, the trots that sort of activated me as a Marxist in community college. So I was like, you know, a nationalist oriented kind of American and, you know, grappling with socialism. And I would argue with these trots. These trots ended up convincing me that Marxism was, you know, like, or communism. They ended up convincing me that communism was a worthwhile goal, but they didn't really sell me on you know, that they had a special science about it. They seemed like cranks. But my favorite thing was that they were a break off of the American chapter of Lut Ouvrières International. And the reason that they broke off from the Lut Ouvrières International is over their position on the Soviet Union, which I kind of, I laughed to myself when I heard that. And they're like, well, their position on the Soviet Union was that Russia, contemporary Russia, was still a very degenerated worker state and therefore should be supported. Putin's Russia. Anyway, just a fun, a fun little origin story for me. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm actually surprised that uh, Magnair doesn't point out that a lot of these anti-imperial factions of Trotskyism defend degenerated worker states in such a way that they actually end up being quasi-nationalists, but never nationalists for their own country, which is different than the Stalinist ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they or, become nationalists for Assad or for Putin, but not for America. There are Trotskyists that go towards NATO and American nationalism, but those are usually in the sort of like Max Schachman tradition. Or they're platypus. Oh yeah, on the prediction thing, yeah, I think a, like a scientific theory, it's hard to make predictions about the future. You know, I think prediction in science is kind of different than prediction of future. Well, I, I think it's much easier to predict things about the past. That's the way I feel about it. But, uh, uh, you know, you know, you'll have a scientific theory about, uh, you know, like the velocities of molecules in the container. And, you know, your theory will predict the, you know, maybe the distribution of velocities, but, you know, it might not predict what might happen to the container in the future. I hear you. I just, I had a little side note on when we were talking about Argentinian politics. I remember reading in The Economist about 10 or 15 years ago about the ex-Argentinian president, Carlos Menem, I think his name was. And uh, he basically, he ran a, a campaign like to the left and then saying that he wouldn't, nas or they were going to like nationalize stuff or they would never privatize. And when he got into power, he just privatized goddamn everything he could get his hands on. And they they had an they had a quote in the in the Economist when they asked him, but like, why did you tell everybody that you weren't going to do this? And he and he said to them, "Well, if I told them what I was going to do, they never would have elected me." <laughs> you gotta love uh, Argentinian politics. You have to remember though, Puya, that trots actually define science differently than everybody else does. They define it based off of like Hegel specifically from Trotsky's article, Our Logic and Theirs. And they kind of have a Newtonian like idea of dialectics leads to solid predictable laws that you can kind of predict the future with, if so facto, the end. And science has moved on from those kind of predictions. Like Magnair doesn't talk about any of this because it's not like he he's not dealing with with the ideologies involved. He's dealing. I, I think he is trying to strict strictly limit himself to the strategy of the international. But I have a hard time doing that because it all ties back. Like the reason why these things are so fractious and they can't centralize is because they try to centralize things that don't even seem about politics, like your stance on what science is. Yeah, and this comes from just a really. I don't know what else to say it. I don't know how else to say it. And this is a tradition that I'm greatly inspired by and influenced by. But it's a fucking garbage grasp of what dialectics was supposed to mean in Hegel or in Marx or whatever, or however applied. And like, you end up with this garbage grinder of Hegel into Leninism, where whatever was bad about Hegelianism just gets amped up to like the third degree. And this is true for the Trotskyists that are more sympathetic to Hegel because of things Trotsky wrote, and true of the Stalinists that ended up being very resentful towards the Hegelian tradition because you know it, it sort of pre presented a humanist challenge of their reading of Marx. I think it's not just Trotskyism too, because like I, I was listening to a podcast and I don't, I'm not going to name names because I think they're pretty cool actually, but I was listening to a podcast where 
they were kind of debating like Marxism as a science and the people defending Marxism seemed very, the Marxism as a science, I should say, seemed to have that kind of like this, that Trotsky sense of like a Marxism as a special science. It sounded really crank. And I ended up agreeing with the people who didn't identify as Mar- Marxist more, although they had their problems. It just seems to like poison the analysis with all of Leninism, I, th- I think. And I don't even know if Lenin himself would have even like been on board with all this, but it's just something I've noticed. Can I read this, Tom? Derek, I was just going to suggest it. The plethora of international sex has had an effect among the broad layers of activists of discrediting the entire idea of an organized workers' international political movement. Internationalism has, as a result, become reduced to two elements. The first is the effort to promote and or reform the United Nations and the international rule of law. Whatever their intentions, these actually serve to give political support to global U.S.-led capitalist nation states. The second is a fundamentally liberal international solidarity around hotspots in global politics based on moral hatred of suffering and injustice rather than on positive strategy of international action of the working class. These campaigns do some useful work, but led nowhere and rarely reach deeply into the working class. To the extent there is a strategy involved in anti-imperialist internationalism of this sort, it is the Maoist third worldist idea of surrounding the cities, i.e. that the revolution in the colonial world can overthrow the imperialist world order. The present character of the Chinese and Vietnamese regimes and all the formerly radical third worldist machines all too clearly show the falsity of this strategy. Around the year 2000, there was there appeared to be a small glimmer of hope for a new broad international movement in the anti-globalization movement and the World Socialist Forums. But the NGO bureaucracies of the major national parties and unions and the NGO supporting these movement have combined with the dominance of the anarchistic movementist idea into the ranks of produce a series of no doubt interesting political talking shops. Uh, as a side note, McNair's writing before, I think before Occupy happens and we see this third thing ends in Occupy and ends with Occupy. I, I actually was interested though, because the first the first strategy about international law, that's been abandoned since like the 90s, right? Like I haven't heard people talking about that. Tom uh, still talks about it all the time. But who in Mark's world still does? Can someone elaborate on what exactly that means? Like, do they think that like so, like socialist countries need to go into the UN and advocate for themselves? Like, what exactly does that mean? They think that they could use the UN and reform and the reform of uh, international law to basically set up something like a proto international. I've actually seen this idea emerge again from some like people sympathetic to magnerism um, in America. The writer of Cold Dark Stars thinks something similar, particularly around climate change forcing it. But I tend to agree that it would kind of lead to many structures still standing. And I'll pick up on these last two paragraphs. The direct action alternative in the anti-globalization movement has largely represents merely an opportunity for some youth to have the party with the police. After the first media shocks of the 1990s, this has had about as much practical effect of the same militants, which were to expend the same energy fighting the police after football matches. As a side note, This is probably the most common form of radical action right now, which is why anytime anybody says anything critical of Occupy, even social Democrats start waving their hands and being like, no, you can't do that. We have to fight the fascists. And by that, I mean some journalist in the streets of Portland because we won't even attack. I don't know a militia movement that came there a week before, but whatever. And I just pissed off all your listeners, Tom, but whatever. Um, the root of this catastrophe in the second, third, and fourth international shared a common false conception of the role of international action of the working class and revolutionary strategy and the variant of the communist Bonapartist centralism, the idea of the general staff of the world revolution. The result has been to produce international sex on one hand and reaction from proletarian internationalism and international organization, negative dialectical response to internationalist sex. I posted that quote about direct action and I was expecting it to piss off some of my anarchist friends and it pissed off more Marxists. And it seems like they get caught up in, I don't know, for lack of a better term, like semantical arguments and kind of nitpicking because they just don't like hearing this, which is so weird because you would think these aren't like left communists or anything like that. These are just Marxists, you know, and 
you would think that they would be on board with this. And I think people just don't like hearing this kind of criticism, even if they are critical of them th it's themselves. You know, and then they also get caught up in like, you know, okay, maybe it was a little, a little bit more effective than football matches and McNair was having a go, as you might say. But it's still a valid point overall, I think. To tie this back to uh, kind of the, our discussion of like the Trotskyist sex and these different internationals, wasn't there like some, like didn't McNair talk about earlier about how like some trot groups thought that the anti-globe movement was going to be like a revival of the left after like the collapse of the Soviet Union? How did yes, that tie into all this? They did. They they really did. That that was why the ISO was all over the place on this kind of stuff. Like they would kind of go in and run like, hey, anti-globalist stuff, but really communism. Also, that was why they took the approach they took the Occupy, except a lot of them have been burnt by the anti-globalization movement going nowhere, so they didn't respond to Occupy at all. Um, that was also true for a lot of Maoist parties, too. So I mean, what's funny to me about this stuff is this is all from 15 years ago at, at best. But some of it, the more, you know, when, the, when he's talking about the things that are more serious, right, that stuff has kind of gone away. And all you have is like the ghost of anti-imperialist internationalism, except you don't really have them defending actual states, except for sometimes China, maybe. Because you don't hear this about Vietnam anymore. Uh, maybe North Korea, which is weird. The direct action stuff, which which I pointed out the other day that like that Marxist defensiveness literally breaks like five or six Marxist principles, not just one. That individual terrorism is not democratic. That propaganda for the deed invites repression. That it tends to radicalize people rightward, not leftward. And these are things fucking Marx and Lenin said. It's it's wild how we have dropped that plank as a critique because I guess Trump is scary. Although, in every other point where we're dealing with with some stuff in Europe and stuff, the people they were fighting were objectively scarier. And so I, I think this has led to all kinds of crazy opportunism, which, interestingly enough, has actually killed most these sects, and they've now liquidated into like factions within the DSA, but they still function the same way. Like in the last paragraph there, I've underlined there, he talks about how it was a false conception of having it as a general staff of the world revolution. The reason why people get so defensive about these things is kind of sad, really, is that we're so far away from these debates that all the sides look like they're the same. They're on the same side or something. When in, in reality, like McNair really does mean that these things had about as much effectiveness as football riots. Because, and this isn't a long standing uh, Kautskian critique, but also has a little bit of precedent in Marx and Engels, is that there was no institutional you know, remainder from Occupy, almost as a matter of principle. And for a lot of these wor world social forum things, that wasn't necessarily a matter of principle. That principle came out of frustrations of these autonomous hopes that maybe if we kind of relax our, you know, latent kind of drive to organize and let, you know, the social do its thing, it'll develop some momentum and, and we'll build towards, you know, the next international you know, or something. You know, people were hoping for that at one point. A lot of these things have fallen apart, doesn't seem like anything works. And so a lot of the classical critiques of, let's say, you know, the general strike or the mass strike, you know, in the general Marxist tradition, there was a lot of pushback to this. And now there's there's not really like a consciousness that like mass strikes would at all be at odds with, it, with um, you know, Marxist institution building or what have you. And that's, you know, not to weigh in on one side or the other, but just Marxists can't tell these things apart because they're so far away from the historical context. Well, look, uh, Lexi, you may say that Occupy has fallen apart and there's nothing left, but look at this. Occupy Wall Street Twitter account, <laughs> oh, 198,000 oh, followers. They tweeted on June the 5th, okay, about drones, and then they, treated, they tweeted on April the 28th. No, sorry, they retweeted in April the 28th. Oh. And, about a nonviolent um, takeover of frat spaces. Okay, and then they retweeted on February the 5th. So you say that these things have gotten <laughs> apart, but I say to you that they live on in Twitter space. Not even the dead are safe, Tom. <laughs> For people getting into radical politics right now, like a lot of these debates that happen, like going all the way back to like Marx and Bakunin are just like 
you know, aside from the question of the state, like aren't even really even like discussed, like the actual debates that they had over strategy and tactics, they are treated like utterly esoteric things that nobody should bother studying. And you just study the sort of grand theory and then like the big debates over the state. And it's like, there's no actual discussion about this even like it, it feels like i've been studying this stuff for years and it's only recently that i've actually been able to like hear some discussion about the history of tactics and strategy in the movement it's easy to understand how there's this incredibly confused sort of perspective about tactics that tends to sort of lump together like various marxist theories with various anarchist theories with no clear distinctions and just sort of a lot of voluntarism and movementism. And uh, it, it, it's, it's just a complete mess. I think things are even more of a mess right now because of the end of the sectarian model has, has led to what I like to uh, coin a phrase that are, or maybe Lexi coined it. I don't know which one of us did, but the primitive accumulation of cadre problem where everything exists just against more people. <laughs> because we just need the people so that we can then think about strategies and tactics. And it's been very frustrating to me. And also socialist education is bad. A lot of the sex lie. And even in books, like I have scholarly books, you know, that were quasi peer review put out from a multi-tendency, although it was a trot press, who knows what the hell it is now, who actually get facts wrong about, like, say, Kowski's verding record in 1914. So you don't even really know what the actual divisions were. They repeat party lies, like outright repeat things that were false. And it's not just Stalinists to do this. It's across the board. The other problem is that, I mean, how many people here, be honest, learn more about socialist history from listening to a historical podcast like revolutions or reading a straight up history book, even when it's written by an anti-communist than any of the official, you know, the, the official theoretical stuff on this history. Oh, there's no comparison. The kind of qualities of scholarship you get from actual history books, you know, Marxist or not versus like the canned histories that are associated with sects. Yeah, and when it comes to like, you know, social democratic parties, like they don't even have the slightest interest in education of their voters, like zero. Well, they have a negative investment in Yeah, <laughs> in absolutely. If, if if your cadre get educated, they'll get smart enough to leave. So you have to exploit them when they're dumb and or at least naive, you know? <laughs> like and so it when if you teach them too much, they're gonna leave. Right. Also, students have to learn in other capacities, and students are the basic form of activists because they have leisure time and you cannot pay them. Is, it, is this the Joseph Fritzl school of politics? Does anybody know who, who Joseph Fritzl is? Nope. <laughs> I don't. You got me. He was the Austrian guy a few years ago that got found with like a couple of his daughters living in the basement who he was like. Oh, God. Yeah, I remember that. Sexual relations oh. with. Well, that's the that's the most extreme expression of something like that. That actually yeah. has happened with British Maoist groups, not daughters, but like people running. Yeah, there was one recent that that there was only like last year or the year before that one woman escaped from a house in South London and she'd been in some weirdo sex Maoist cult for the last twenty years oh. trying to get out. Oh my god! Oh yeah, my god. it happened. It happens a fair amount, but it, it's interesting because I think like. For example, the Bakunin-Marx debates are way more substantive than I think people realize. And honestly, there are a couple of things that Bakunin says where I'm like, Bakunin's not even that wrong. That's interesting. Like what? Well, Bakunin's stance on the peasants being naturally reactionary, where he says, like, they are, but they kind of hate the bourgeoisie. <laughs> like That's why they appear to central authority, because they don't think anyone else can help them. He's right about that like that that actually is how politics work even now in china like the way the the ccp uses rural dissatisfaction and people forget rural china is still ridiculously poor they have been strategically left out of the development they are only allowed to migrate in the cities in very selective waves because there's an internal passport system and the reason why is they're afraid if they they couldn't expand their economic growth fast enough to accommodate them all in the city. That's part of how the Chinese miracle doesn't fall apart because people forget there's not freedom of movement within China itself. This is actually kind of a huge issue. 
because what that leads to is when the they're not really peasants, but when like the agrarian labor force gets angry, even if it's angry at the Communist Party of China, they will take out their anger on a lower level official by appealing to say Xi Jinping, which means that the secretariat has has a disproportionately high rural base, even when the rural base is mad at the Communist Party of China, and that still kind of holds true that's the same pattern you saw in like france and the Vendee. i mean it's 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 weird um now technically chinese agrarian workers are not peasants they don't actually own their land but you get my point sophie why don't you read this uh these two couple of paragraphs here the first international was launched on the back of the campaigns of british radicals and the workers movement in 1862 to 63 to prevent britain intervening on the side of the slave owner confederacy and the american civil war the immediate moment of its launch in 1864 was an appeal by london trade union leaders to paris workers leaders for joint action in support of the polish struggle for independence its activity consisted of a combination of international strike support, both financial and through urging secondary action, with political intervention against national oppression, Poland, Ireland, and against threats of war. The Second International was prepared by attempts in the early 1800s to unite European socialists, but took its real impetus as a movement from the Chicago Haymarket Massacre of 1884 and the consequent struggle for May Day as an international workers' festival. The International was formally founded in 1889 and made the struggle for May Day a symbolic center of its work. Okay, so McNair is making the kind of give us a historical uh, look back on where these internationals came from. And he, he, he makes a case that about the second international that it was largely symbolic in what it organized around symbols like the May Day and stuff like that. And it was far from an org like uh, this um, general staff of the revolution. Who wants to read a bit of this next bit? I can read. Everybody, Puya has got something very important to tell us all. He can, he can read. Yeah. Well done, <laughs> Puya. Oh my oh, God, Dorf. Tom, you're so oh sassy God. today. Oh, you're so Damn. sassy. <laughs> Damn, leave Puya <laughs> alone. I can read. <laughs> at a at a <laughs> at a twelfth grade level, at least. <laughs> okay. The second international remained until 1900, merely a series of socialist congresses that passed resolutions. Without a leading body equivalent to the General Council of the First International, which could respond rapidly to events or organize strike solidarity. In 1900, the International Socialist Bureau was established. The online catalog of archives held in Amsterdam by the International Institute of Social History suggests, although the IISH's holdings may well be defective, <laughs> the ISB was proportionately considerably less active than the General Council of Foreign International had been. The first international had been an international of practical tasks. The second international was, starting with May Day, mainly one of symbols. Why? The fundamental explanation is that its leaders thought that the struggle for work workers' power was one conducted within the boundaries of single countries. Following Marx and Engels, that the proletariat of each country must, of course, First of all, settle matters within its, with its own bourgeoisie. It is not clear how far Marx and Engels still believe this in their later lives. After all, in 1864, inaugural address of a first international had asserted that past experience has shown how disregard of the bond of brotherhood, which ought to exist between working men of different countries and incite them to stand firmly by each other in all their struggles for emancipation, will be chastised by the common discomfiture of their coherent efforts. And Ingalls, in his 1875 letter to Babel, criticizing the Go Gotha program, had commented that the German party should be conscious of its solidarity with the workers of all other countries and will, as before, always be ready to meet obligations that solidarity entails. Such obligations, even if one does not definitely proclaim or regard oneself as part of the international consists, for example, in aid, abstention from backlegging during strikes, making sure that party organs keep German workers informed of the movements abroad, agitation against impeding or uh, dynastic wars, and 
during such wars an attitude which was exemplary maintained in 1870 and 1871, etc. However, after the split with the Bakuninists, Marx and Engels had supported the move away from maintaining the international as such in favor of building national parties that organized working class political action at the national level. The logic of this policy, as we have seen, to place a major emphasis on growth and strength of these national parties. Ultimately, if necessary, implying the pursuance of a revolutionary defensive policy in war. It seems like McNair really is advocating for internationalism here. <laughs> He's going full, full gun ho. Yeah, I was, I was fascinated by the fact that this actually does kind of indicate that some of the problem comes from trying to figure out what Marx's and Engels's later stance is, because the focus on one's national bourgeoisie, which is cited by a lot of, a, you know, like official anti-imperialists, and even like Lisa Mao has come up with theories about like comprador, you know, bourgeoisie, so favoring your national bourgeoisie over the international bourgeoisie, etc. You can get that from a pretty broad reading of the manifesto, but later Marx seems to, but doesn't explicitly contradict that. And that's kind of a problem for figuring out what we're actually supposed to see as a Marxist international program. Mm -hmm. Because it's really different what he says. The other thing is, is that line from the manifesto gets tied back to like one statement Actually, in the labor notes section, which I don't want to go into, that's a long debate that I want to avoid, of the critique of the Goethe program about bourgeois structures still existing in the transitional form of socialism. And you add those two things together and you get like all kinds of like this, uh, like, well, you know, it's, it, it is okay to support your national bourgeoisie in your third world socialist revolution, even though so far, every time you do that, it either leads to a Cadillo military takeover or to corporate takeovers where you have different competing factions vying for your your resources, even if that competing faction is theoretically a communist country like China. And theoretically, it's pretty hard there. Yeah, but there's some places where Marx definitely advocates where he like uh, states a necessity for international movement. Like in the German ideology, there's definitely a point where he talks about the necessity of a social system being international no one's arguing but the thing is no one would argue that they weren't being international they're arguing about the time frame do you have to develop your productive capacities with your national bourgeoisie first uh, honestly like Ch- china's what i you know its current nep on crack is it's based off of that theory like they do actually have a marxist rationale for it I think Marx thought the time frame would be very, at least in that book, he said that, I think, there's, yeah, there's a point where he talks about it, and he says, all at once, you know, all the revolutions at once. It's important to remember that Marx is a human, and so as such, he's going to, like, change his mind or just, like, think things through and develop. And I also am in favor of, like, I, I just really get frustrated with people who, like, pit the older Marx versus the younger Marx. Because I think it's important to like take a step back and look about how his all of his thoughts have developed, right? I guess when I was reading this, my takeaway was that you need to organize your own uh, working class and your own nation state before you can even really have a chance for internationalism. Because if we try, so for example, if we try to do like set up an international now, it would just end up looking something similar to the weird. Trotskyist sexlet internationals that are essentially useless. So it doesn't make any sense right now. So first you need to build up uh, working class movements within your own nation. And then once there is enough organized workers across you know s- certain areas, in particular around your continent first, then you can organize maybe at, le- at first like a continental as Derek says later on, or not Derek, sorry, McNair. Derek probably is freaking out about that Freudian slip. But then also kind of in response to what Derek was talking about as far as national liberation movements and the uh, building up of the you know productive forces and, and things like that under actually existing socialism, I think that the best way to, the most accurate way, I should say, to conceive of these national liberation struggles that were done in the 20th century as just essentially a bourgeois revolution. And I know that's going to piss off a lot of MLs and, and what have you, but 
that's what they end up looking like mostly, especially when you have, you know, Marxist theories of like supporting your national bourgeoisie over the international bourgeoisie. The idea is that you're kicking out the colonizers, right? And I think that aspect of it, of, you know, kicking out colonizers is actually a good thing. And I don't think most of us disagree, although maybe I'm wrong. But even if it's done with the support of the USSR or done with red flags, that is essentially what is happening there. It's a national liberation movement against colonizers for the independence of a nation state. And to build up its productive forces is, you know, essentially what happens under capitalism. Now, it gets complicated with whether or not the labor theory of value is, is operative in, in these countries or not. So it's not like a perfect framework, I suppose. But at the end of the day, they're trying to accumulate capital build up their productive forces and do what capitalism does either explicitly or through some weird Soviet style. Yeah. I, th- I think the ML would take issue with that only because there's a tradition that actually isn't related to Stalin. Stalin actually did have a kind of developmentalist positive view of bourgeois revolutions, believe it or not, that capitalism is so degenerated that there can be no radical bourgeois revolutions anymore. And also, like, if you say you're a socialist and you win, you are obviously a socialist, even if you don't do anything socialisty, which is the inconsistent standard that we apply. I mean, you you get this with, like, Juse, apologist, who will talk about how communist North Korea is, but actually miss at North Korea. Like, the, Kim Jong-un's been so successful because he's actually, like, NEP, the North Korean economy, and um, introduced sharecropping to collective labor so the peasants don't starve. And I, I use peasants there because, well, peasants is the right word, ag- agrarian workers, but that's actually a huge issue in, in, in North Korea. And Kim Jong-un has navigated that. We don't discuss that in America for two reasons. One, the anti-North Korea propaganda campaign run by our own country, but two, because communists don't want to admit that that's going on there because it also is a loosening of... Uh, prior here collective agriculture and its liberalizations and we can't admit there's liberalizations going on in North Korea and that's why life is getting slightly better there. So this does lead to all kinds of strategic nightmare problems I think. And whereas the trots the trots are pretty are are better about defending um bourgeois revolutions as radical and I mean I've read like you know people who are adjacent to Stalinists like world systems theorists who aren't Stalinists and like accusing them of that. I like some world systems theorists but they I mean I've seen like uh Wallerstein go as far as say that like he wishes capitalism never happened at all and that bourgeois culture is you know totally regressive and so like that that thrain is going through a lot of those people's ideas about how things work you know like I don't think calling a, a lot of those third world national liberations bourgeois revolutions is even an insult to them frankly. And to be clear I didn't mean it as an insult that's kicking out colonizers and having independence is a good thing. I know. I'm just. Uh, I'm talking to the MLs like more than you. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to like talk about this whole question of settling matters of the national bourgeoisie first, and then also that idea of like the comprador bourgeoisie and like the national bourgeoisie. I can understand the logic of building a base on a national level, uh, absolutely, but when you look at sort of the actual problems that that strategy runs into, it can be like hard to see how you can ever get out of that cul-de-sac. So for example, uh, you know, I don't, I don't wanna say that like there was any kind of great Marxist theorization behind their strategy, but like just here in Alberta, like the, what the uh, NDP, the sort of like right social Democrats here did when they were in government was very much like, okay, we're just going to focus on dealing with our provincial bourgeoisie. We're going to focus on building up the workers movement here to some degree. And it led to this like really awful policy of social chauvinism that it, it really like sabotaged strategizing at a class level for the country. It created a lot of ill will between uh, Albertan workers and workers from other provinces it fed right into the hands of like right wing politics that that like very successfully created the conditions for the conservatives to get back into power because the focus on building up the sort of national bourgeoisie here in this province like didn't make them any more favorable to actually supporting any kind of even like right social democratic politics 
so I, I just like having seen this kind of experience, and then you can point to the more obvious ones like you know first world war and so on. Uh, it, it's it's hard to see how this strategy actually works out in practice. The best model we can go off of right now is the early second international, in that when you have a workers' party or some kind of larger like workers' movement kind of gain a foothold in a, a particular nation state, and hopefully there'll be other parties that maybe or or work movements that are maybe not quite as big, but are also kind of like rising up, you can start to build an international from there. Then I guess also I kind of like take some of my ideas of internationalism kind of from a loosely, very, very, very loosely, but from that quote of Bordiga, I think it was Bordiga or saying something to the effect that like the USSR shouldn't control the international, the international should be in charge of the USSR. And what that would mean is that even though these other countries that are a part of the international aren't socialist yet, you can uh, have the Workers' Party internationally have a say in, in socialist policies and in strategy all across the uh, different sections of the international. Obviously, you have to have some protections and respect for autonomy and individual cultures. So you can't just like dictate to different members of the international what they should do. But the emphasis should be put on the international proletariat and the political structure of an international and not vice versa. The, an international shouldn't be just a vehicle for the USSR or whatever country has a social revolution first to push their policies onto their members. And similarly, like whatever we're constructing should be a vehicle for the fruition of the workers movement or you know the pro of proletarian agency more generally and not the other way around. <laughs> On this episode, you heard the theme tune The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters and The Night of the Purple Moon by Sunra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit and Swampside Chats. Thank you.